about a very familiar story today. We're going to be talking about a man in scripture named Zacchaeus. And most of us know the story of Zacchaeus, but uh, we're going to dig a little deeper into it and see what's in there for us today. But before we get to the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, I want to put up on the screen Galatians 2.20, and I want to ask you uh, to read the scripture together with me. You've heard me quote these things many times when I preach. It's kind of a favorite scripture of mine to help us understand who we are and that we have been crucified with Christ. We live for him. But I want us to read this together because it's kind of a foundation for this message today, and I want to know it's seated in you. So let's begin this. I have been crucified with Christ. All right, so I know that's in there. I know I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the story of Zacchaeus because that's going to be critical to the story. So I'm in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, wait. All right, here we go. Luke 19, 1. He, that being Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable to because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and he received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, Lord. Half of my possession I'll give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give back to them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which has been lost. Now listen, this story of Zacchaeus, I think we've been hearing since we were kids. If you remember when we were kids, it was Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Okay, we know that song. Uh, It's because it's a very, very familiar story. And when we look at this story, it's been taught many, many ways, none of which I'm saying are wrong, but here's some of the ways maybe we've heard this. Hey, this story is about a man who is short in stature, and he ends up climbing a tree because he really wants to see Jesus, and Jesus comes by and says he wants to have a meal with him, so Zacchaeus has him over for dinner, and he gets saved That's awesome. What a great story. Or maybe you've heard it as Zacchaeus was a man who was a tax collector, and he had a really skewed mentality about money, and he was rich, and he was defrauding people. But when he had this interaction with Jesus, it changed his whole mindset about money. Or maybe you've heard it about that Jesus really wants to come and dine with you. That what Jesus is really looking for is the opportunity to meet you, to dine with you, to come in and abide with you. And those are all valid. Those are all true stories that we can take out of, true thoughts that we can take out of this. But what I want to do today is go into the scripture and I want to look at some of the word choices and I want to look at some of the meanings and see if we can't dig more out of the story than just a short guy who was wealthy who had to climb a tree and ended up having dinner with Jesus. You good with that? Yeah. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, verse 1, he, Jesus entered Jericho. What do we know about Jericho? Jericho is a city in the promised land. It was the first city that the Israelite nation conquered when they came into the promised land. If you remember, they crossed over the Jordan River. They camped out there. They saw Jericho. Uh, God told them to go and march around the city seven times and the seven days seven times and blow your horns. And the walls would fall and they went in and the city crumbled. Uh, Not only did the city crumble, but they were told, don't take anything from the city But a man named Aken did, and he hid it in his tent, Uh, and his entire family ended up suffering because he did that, and the Israelite nation lost the next battle to a little town called Ai because Aken wasn't obedient. And so we know this about Jericho, but one of the things you may not know is in Joshua chapter 6, Joshua curses Jericho. 
Joshua condemns it and he says, look, nobody should rebuild the city. If anybody does, when they start to lay the foundation again, they'll lose their first son. And at the end, when they finalize the city and they lay the end brick in the city, they'll lose their last son. And it was a con cursed, condemned city by Joshua. He said, I don't want this thing rebuilt. Now, a man ended up doing it, ended up lost, losing two children over it. But it was a condemned city. So Zacchaeus lives in a condemned city. That's going to be important here in a minute. So look at verse 2. He was a tax collector. Now, not only was he a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector. Now, if you don't know the history, you don't understand why he is so despised because he's a tax collector, because he's collecting tax for Rome. Rome has come in and invaded. They have the city at the time. They have this territory. And so when Rome comes in, they hire people out of the Israelite nation to collect taxes from the Israelites to give to Rome. So the Israelite nation, his brotherhood kind of sees him as a traitor. They kind of see him as a sinner, one who has left God and is now persecuting the people for their money. And even Zacchaeus tells us later that he has defrauded some people to gain extra wealth for himself. So they just despise him. He's an evil, sinful man because he's left the Israelite nation. He's working for the Romans and collecting money from them. It also says that he was rich. He was a wealthy man. Now, we know that some of that wealth was ill-gotten because of his confession, but we also know that he was a wealthy man, and we know that in this time, Scripture, when Jesus talks about the wealthy, he says it's impossible for a man to serve two masters. Either he'll serve the one and hate the other, or hate the one and serve the other, and that serving money is a problem. He says it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom than a camel to enter through the eye of the needle. And, and just so I can bust some bubbles in the room, I've been to Israel. I've talked to scholars in Israel. There is no gate called the eye of the needle. There was no place where camels got down on their knees and got through a, a thin place, and so therefore it's okay for rich people... That's not what he's saying. His point in the scripture was, it's very difficult if you love money to love God. Uh, because you're loving the things of this world and you're, 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 you're uh, looking after the created instead of the creator. So it is a challenge when you have money. But God said there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. Just be generous if you're wealthy. So he goes on to say he was a rich man. And we know that when Jesus talked to the one rich ruler, he said, hey, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, go sell all that you have and follow me. And that rich young ruler went away sadly because he had much wealth. And I was reading a commentary this week. Maybe you can go do this on your own. I thought it was really exciting for a while as I watched it unfold. But some people believe that that rich young ruler who left Jesus that day sad actually came back to Jesus. He came back to Jesus at night and his name was Nicodemus. And there's very good supporting evidence by a secular writer named Josephus that Nicodemus was the rich young ruler and he and Joseph of Arimathea were good friends. And so when they went to get the body of Jesus, you'll notice Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were there and they put him in Joseph of Arimathea's uh, um, tomb, tomb and they believed that was because Nicodemus no longer had money, no longer had wealth, no longer had a place to lay him. I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, I, I just thought the evidence of it was pretty fascinating, but we know we have this challenge with money and what the world has to offer and serving God. Now, let's look at verse 3. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable to because of the crowd. In other words, what Zacchaeus wanted to see those around him were preventing him from seeing. The world around Zacchaeus was preventing him from seeing Jesus. Now, now watch this. The world around him, the people around him, were all the people that he was collecting money from and he was getting wealthy off of. Could it be that part of the problem was that he was receiving so much of the world's compensation that it made it difficult for him to see Jesus? Could it be because he was looking at how the world compensates and maybe he had to overcome the world in order to see Jesus. Uh, maybe he had to rise above the world in order to see Jesus. So let me kind of recap where we are at this point. 
Here's a man who comes from a place of condemnation, and he's caught up in what this world has to offer, and what this world has to offer prevents him from seeing Jesus. But what is he trying to see? Because the scripture says that Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus, and he couldn't because he was short, so he went and climbed a tree, right? Now, let me just ask you in the way of grammar and sentence structure. If he just wanted to see Jesus, why doesn't the scripture say Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, so he went ahead and climbed a tree so that he could? It's not what it says. It says Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and he was unable to because of the crowd. Now, think about that. If I wanted to see you, I could get in position to see you. But if I want to know who you are, I have to get to know you. It says Zacchaeus wanted to know who Jesus was. Who is this man? So it's more than just being able to get in a position to physically see him because it doesn't say he just wanted to see him. He wanted to know who he was. It's an interesting choice for what he wanted to do. And then you'll notice it says that he climbed a tree. In four, it says, so he ran ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. Now, this to me is strange. Let me tell you why I think it's strange. Where is Zacchaeus geographically? He's in Jericho. Jericho is a city. And if you remember the cities of that time, this is a walled city, so everything is inside the walls, and yet when it comes time for him to position himself to see who Jesus was, he doesn't go climb on top of a building. He doesn't go get on top of a house. He doesn't go up into a window and look out. He doesn't stand on a well. He doesn't find a wall somewhere in the city where he can get up high. He goes onto a tree. Now, when I read it, I thought, that's really unique that I'm in a city and he's climbing on top of a tree. There must be a reason why he's climbing a tree instead of just going onto a housetop or out a window or on a wall. And then I begin to look at the tree. It tells us it's a sycamore tree. Like, I need to know what kind of tree he got up into. Yeah, why? Because a sycamore tree, you, you'll know this if you look it up, is a fig tree. It is a mulberry. It's in the family of mulberries. Now, if you know anything about mulberry trees, uh, when I lived in Texas, nobody wanted a mulberry tree because their roots grow and they, they brust up your sidewalks and your driveways and all that. But they have these big leaves. They got kind of a three-fingered, huge leaf. So they were considered a great tree for shade. So people wanted uh, uh, these kind of fig trees, these kind of mulberry, this sycamore, in order to create shade. But where else have we heard about a fig tree and leaves? In the garden. In the garden with Adam and Eve. In the garden, they went and took the leaves of a fig tree to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame. Zacchaeus wants to know who is this Jesus, and he goes and he climbs a tree, and it just happens to be a tree that is used to cover one's shame. Three. <laughs> Stay with me. I'll finish. Three of you are with me. We'll just keep going. Look at verse five. When Jesus came to the place, what's the place? The place is where the tree is at. When Jesus came to the place of the tree, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus. Who told him that was the name of the guy in the tree? I got, a, I got, a, I got an inside track for you. He's Jesus. He goes to the place of the tree, and he calls out Zacchaeus. Now listen, you may be thinking he called out a name until you go back and look at what the name Zacchaeus means. The name Zacchaeus means innocent or righteous. So Jesus comes to the place of the tree where shame gets covered up, and he calls to the man and says, you're righteous. Ah. We're going to get there. You're going to get there. Zacchaeus is on the tree that takes away shame. 
and Jesus is calling him righteous. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. No. Look. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Oh, come on. Come on. Why would he say must? Why didn't he say, Zacchaeus, come down, hurry, I'm hungry, I want to go to your house and eat. Uh, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, I'm going to dine with you tonight. No, what he said was, Zacchaeus, at the cross where shame is covered up and I've called you righteous, now I have to live in you. All right, let me put it all together. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and God's spirit dwells in you? Zacchaeus, I must dwell in your house today. He lives in a condemned place. He goes to the tree. It is the tree that covers shame. Jesus declares him innocent and righteous there and then says, I must dwell in your house. Come on. Okay, verse 8. So Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possession I'll give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give him back four times as much. Why four times as much? Why didn't Zacchaeus say ten times? Why didn't he say I'll give him double or I'll just give him that amount back? It's because Zacchaeus knows the law. Zacchaeus goes back in what we call Exodus chapter 22, and it says, If a man ever steals a sheep from another man, then he is to return to him fourfold. If you remember when David uh, was with Bathsheba and his friend Nathan came to him, and Nathan tells him this story. He says, David, what would you do to this man? This man was a wealthy man and had a lot of his sheep, but there was a poor man who only had one. And the wealthy man came and took the one man's sheep. What do you think we should do, David? And David said that man should return it fourfold. Why? Because fourfold was the repayment when you stole something. And Zacchaeus knows, I've stole from these people, so I need to give it back fourfold. So he understands the law. But I think what's happening in the story is this is where Zacchaeus is expressing repentance. It's where he's saying, I know I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore, there's a sanctification process that happens. There's a change that has to happen in me. I have to be a new creation. Nine. Then Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. He understood the law. Now, if we go back to the beginning and say, why are we reading this story? Well, because it's a cute story about a short guy who couldn't see over the crowd, and he had to climb up into a tree in order to see Jesus. And it just so happened that Jesus went by that tree. It just so happened that he saw him up there in the leaves. And it just so happened that he said, come on down, I'll eat dinner with you tonight. I think there's more for us to learn from the story. And I think there's two groups of people in this room who can learn two different things from the story, maybe some the same. But one group in this word room is those who already believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're a believer in what he's done. You've already gone through that salvation process. So I want to look back at this story and say, what do we need to see as believers out of the Zacchaeus story since it's been preserved for us? Here's what, uh, one thing I think we can learn. You've got to look above the world if you want to see who Jesus is. You got to look at the world and say, you are an obstruction to me seeing who Jesus really is to me. I've got to rise above this. I've got to look past this. I can't let these things of the world become so important to me that I can no longer see who Jesus is. I can't let this stuff get in the way. I can't look at what I want. What the world has to offer me is keeping me from seeing who Jesus really is. Maybe as a believer, I could look at this story and say, the tree will cost you something. The cross will cost you something. The cross will cost me something in my walk. It cost a sacrifice in me. It cost me to lay down things of my own. It cost me to lay down my own wants and needs. There's a cost that comes. Listen to me. Salvation is free. But following Christ has a price. It's a cost. And, and Zacchaeus Paid it. And maybe, maybe this one. 
If you want to know, believer, who you really are, find out what Jesus calls you. If you want to know what your ministry really is, find out what Jesus says it is. Does he call you a prophet? Does he call you a pastor? Does he call you an evangelist? Does he call you a deacon? What does he call you? Because whatever he calls you is the truth. What he called Zacchaeus was righteous and innocent. And it was true of Zacchaeus from that point forward. So let's look at the other side. What if you don't believe in Christ and you're in the room? And, and I read this story. What, what could I learn out of this? Here's what I think this story shows you. If you want to know the Savior, you've got to go to the tree. If you want to know the Savior, you've got to go to the cross. If you want to know who this Jesus is, if you want to know what the most epic event in all of time is, it's at the cross. It is the most epic moment that will ever exist was at the cross when Christ died to redeem man to a God who loved them. Mm. Maybe, maybe I would say to the person who doesn't believe in Christ, listen to me. The world is going to try to block your view of Jesus. The world is going to try to get in your way and keep you from seeing Jesus. The world is going to be out there enticing you with what it can compensate you with. And the purpose of that compensation for you is to keep you from being able to see Jesus. And then I would say, like the believer, the one thing you can see from this story is what does Jesus call you? What does Jesus call you? Right now, this one that you don't believe in, what does he call you? Let me tell you what he calls you scripturally. A joint heir. A beloved one. A child of God. So because something happened here with Zacchaeus that I think we completely got in reverse. Because we saw this story all the way through as Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus. He was trying to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus was the pursuer. He was the one going after them until we get to verse 10. And at the end of a story where Zacchaeus is climbing in a tree to see Jesus, we read the phrase, for the Son of Man has come to seek He's come looking. The Son of Man came looking to seek and to save those who are lost. So this was never a story about Zacchaeus trying to see Jesus. It was a story about Jesus finding Zacchaeus. And Jesus knew he was going to be there. Jesus came to the place where he was. It's no mistake that when Jesus came to that place, he was in a tree covered by shame and Jesus called him innocent. That's no mistake because Jesus has a predestined plan to come after you. Jesus is coming after you to meet you. And when you meet Jesus, it's going to change things in your life. It's going to change who you are. Because if you're willing to sit and dine with him, there's going to be a name put on you. It's called innocent. It's called righteous. How does that work? It works this way. God created us. Everything you see, everything going on around you, a creation of God. And God gave it to man. He said, this is your earth. Have dominion over this. Rule over this. Eat from every tree except this one. Be fruitful. Multiply. Conquer this earth. It's yours. You have dominion and rule over it. And then Satan stepped into the garden. And he deceived Adam and Eve. That's what he does. He lies. He steals. He cheats. He came in and he said, did God tell you not to eat from this tree or you die? Oh no. See, if you eat from this tree, you'll be like God. You want to be like God, right? So you should eat from this tree. And they did. And when they did, the dominion over the earth went from them to Satan. Because now they were listening to and following Satan, not listening to and following God who gave them dominion over the earth. So now Satan steps in and makes it miserable for all of us. Brings in misery and sorrow and pain and hurt and crushes us in all kind of ways. But from that very moment that that happened in the garden, God said, I will make a way to redeem this relationship. Here's what I'll do. I'll send my son to this earth. He will walk it out, never betraying me. Never disobeying me, never 
disrespect. Why is that important? Because Jesus comes to this earth, and unlike you and I, the scripture says that every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't want you to miss what that scripture just said because there's two components. I have sinned and I have fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Not only have I sinned, which broke my relationship with him, but I don't have enough glory in myself to stand before him. But Jesus comes and walks it out, never disobeying. Why is that important? Because I am bound for an eternity separated from God because of my sin. Because I've fallen short of the glory. But Jesus never sinned, and he has the glory to stand before God. And a great exchange happens at the cross. Jesus takes my condemned status and gives me his righteous status. So he hangs on a cross and bears the punishment for my sin and dies and is separated from God when he yells out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the cup of wrath against sin is being poured out on him on my behalf. So he takes my condemnation and dies. And if he had stayed dead, he'd be another really good prophet who was saying nice things and died. But on the third day, he came back to life. That is critical to the story. Why is it critical to the story? Because if he died and died, we'd never know if there was an eternity beyond this or not and whether or not we could survive it or be alive in it. But Jesus comes back from the dead and says, I've conquered death. Your body can die, but like me, you're going to continue on. So you believe in me. I will set up an eternity for you that is life. It's with God. You choose not to believe in me, then you set up an eternity away from God. Yes, in a place called hell. But God offers to us through Jesus the opportunity to believe in him. How do I take hold of that? How do I take hold of that? I take hold of it this way. Scripture says that I repent and I believe. Now, what does that mean? I mean, repent's a a big word held up at football games, you know? But here's the reality. That word just means change your mind. Well, what am I thinking that I would need to change my mind? Here's what most of us are thinking. I'm thinking I'm a good person. I'm thinking that I've done more good things than bad things. I'm thinking that God wouldn't want to punish me. I'm trying hard. Listen to me. Adam and Eve sinned once in disobedience and were sent out from the garden and separated from God. The picture for us is I don't have the capability of living a sinless life, and God knows it. So he sends his son to die on my behalf so that I could be covered in the righteousness of Jesus. And so you think, okay, well, if I believe this, if I change my mind to it's not about church, it's not about prayer, it's not about reading the Bible, it's not about being a good person, but really what it's about is that Jesus took the penalty for me and offers me his righteousness. If I change my mind to think that, then what happens tomorrow when I go out and I do something wrong again against God? Does that mean I'm back on my way to hell? Let me help you with that. When Christ died on the cross for Todd Mozingo, I wasn't even born yet. I had not committed a sin yet. So when he died for me, he died for my life. He died to give me coverage. He died so that the blood that he shed would stand before God and say, no, I took all the punishment for Todd. Does that mean I can continue in sin? Paul says, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that when this Savior died for you? Why would you want to do that when all of this joy and things are offered to you? I said this is the first service. I'll say it again. If you take this book and you make a rule book out of it, your life will be miserable. This is not a rule book to condemn you. This is not to show you what you did wrong and what the consequences are. This is a book of life. This is a book of joy. This is a book of peace. When God says, do not commit adultery, why is he saying that? So he can punish you if you do? No, because if you don't, he'll show you real peace in a marriage. And if you do, you'll find out what chaos and and misery and hurt and all of that is about. So it wasn't meant to show you what you're doing wrong. It's meant to show you how to do things right to have that peace and that joy. Here's what, yeah. If you're here today, I'm talking to you. 
about your relationship with Christ and do you know him as your savior? Has he died in your place? Because scripture tells us when we believe that, when we put our faith in that, when I know I'm going to stand before God one day and I'm going to say, no, I'm not righteous enough, but Jesus was, and he took the punishment for me, and I put my faith in him, and I listened to you, and I followed, and I became a child of the living God, and I stepped into the kingdom. God's just going to look at me and say, well done, you figured this thing out. What does it take to have an eternity with your Father in heaven? It takes believing that Jesus died on your behalf. It takes believing that he rose from the dead to show you that he has the keys over Hades and he can give you eternal life. What's your role? Forget what you thought would get you to heaven and believe that it's through Jesus at the tree. See, what Zacchaeus shows us was that he had to go to the tree and he had to have his shame on the tree. And Jesus had to come to the tree and say, I pronounce you innocent, now I'll live in you. That's the story of Zacchaeus, that Jesus went after him, that he found him there. Listen to me. What's Jesus saying to you today? What does he call you? Does he call you brother? Does he call you lost? Does he call you loved? What is he saying to you this morning? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. And if I were to ask the question, are you going to spend an eternity with God in heaven? And your answer is, I hope so. Maybe. I'm not sure. Or no. Listen, the Bible says in 1 John, these things have written, been written down that you may know you have eternal life. How can I know I have eternal life? The scripture says, by knowing that you believe Jesus died on your behalf knowing that you believe he rose again to be able to give eternal life to people. Are you willing to accept that this morning? Are you willing to say, I want that eternal life? Are you willing to say, I get it, I've sinned, I've disobeyed God, but I do want that eternity with him. I do want to walk with him. So how do you do that right now where you are? Not me and you, not asking to stand up, not asking to speak out loud. I'm asking you to have a conversation with God right now in this moment right here. Maybe a conversation where you'd say, I get it, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I've disobeyed you, God, I've disrespected you. And this morning, God, I want to put my belief and my faith that Jesus took my punishment on a cross and that he died on my behalf and that all of the condemnation of the life I was living was paid for and what he did on the cross and that he gave me his righteous standing so I could be hidden in him I could stand behind him with him between me and you God and you would see me through him your righteous son today I believe that he died for me and I believe that he rose again and that he showed up to over 500 people after he rose to prove he had power over death and that he could give me an eternal life so this morning I accept that he died for me, and I believe that he rose again. I'm repenting from what I used to think would get me to heaven, and I'm putting my faith in Jesus. And God, when I stand before you one day, I'll say, I believed that Jesus died for me, and that he gave me a righteous covering so I could live eternally with you. So thank you, God. Right now in this moment, thank you that because I put my faith in Jesus, you have set up an eternity for me with you. Thank you that I'll be saved. Thank you that you begin working in my life and showing me how to have peace and joy. You'll show me how to walk this out. Send me your spirit to help me. Thank you, God, for saving me right here, right now. Hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today in our message. I sincerely hope that God has blessed you in it. I sincerely hope that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life and planting those words in you. If you want to know more about Revive Church, just join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come to our services at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart, Florida. We would love to get to know you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day.